Well, maybe I could claim speaker's privilege then, Prime Minister, and, and pose a, the first question um, to you. You've, you've outlined in a very vivid and real way um, the challenges of climate change uh, to, to your country. And uh, I think uh, we're, we're all aware that in the South Pacific in particular, the real effects are, um, are much um, more apparent in a, in a much more immediate way than in many other countries. Could you give us uh, your perception of what you think the opportunities or the chances are for there to be international agreement on dealing with some of these issues, with particular reference to the South Pacific, because um, we have um, many, nobody really wants to make the first move. Nobody wants to take the first step because they all feel that they'll be disadvantaged. Have you got some thoughts about first mover advantage and how that can be um, marketed in, in the international community? We, uh, <clears throat> we've given a lot of thoughts uh, on this particular issue in the Pacific. The, the leaders, of, uh, leaders of the Pacific uh, are concerned uh, this would happen. But uh, the question is, how can uh, we go about doing it? And uh, I think we've been put in dilemma that uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really know what's the next step to move. If you're living in a little atoll, uh, what's your next move when it affects you? This is a question. And we don't know how the international community could help us, particularly in this region. And I think there are other places too in Indonesia where you have thousands of little islands and atolls uh, and uh, in other parts of Southeast Asia. I think we, uh, we would be greatly affected. Now we, the question has not been answered, and I am wondering, you know, how can we be told or guided this is how we are going to achieve to give assistance to those who have been deprived by nature's change? Do you think that should be a priority for the international community? Yes. Yeah. Sir Michael, uh, Benedict Canole, I worked with you in East Timor on electoral mo monitoring in 2002-2001. I'm just interested in the protocols. You had a lot to say about the behaviour of the Australian Federal Police under the Howard um, government. It, under the um, Rudd government, have the protocols been um, better adhered to? I think to go to a country where you uh, have, uh, where you speak so many different languages. The first thing that you do in a country like this is to understand the people's characteristics, their motives, and how they do things. Uh, to come from, say, a, a city of Sydney and be posted to a place outside uh, uh, Hagen and try to exert your authority, uh, you will find that you'll have a lot of opposition uh, to it. And with the governments, it's always this dialogue process. Uh, people must understand when you are visiting a new country, like my coming to Australia, and I don't know where Pakapaniel in Victoria is. And I turn up suddenly to look for a friend that I, I used to know, and uh, go and start knocking on people's doors without consulting anyone before I go in there. What would people say about me? Silly old fool, what are you doing here? So exactly the same. And we think that the Commonwealth Police were assigned for a purpose uh, to come with an understanding, agreement between us, Papua New Guinea and Australian government. But there are processes you must follow. You've got to learn to live. Uh, before Australians were sent up, and I can go back to history, uh, before Australians were sent up to work in the, the then the territory of Papua New Guinea. They were sent to a sopa for nine to 12 months to know the civil administration, the court system, study about the character of people, to understand the way they think before they are sent up. And when they were posted in a little patrol post in Ayom in Madang province, they knew exactly how to approach people and to deal with people. Here we are, we have an agreement which is put together, combined, 
I'm out of us. No real consultation process. What type of people we would expect to come to Papua New Guinea? And of course, as a country and a sovereign country, when we see things are not right, we have to have objection to. Thank you. Colleen Wright, Sister and I was delighted to hear your talk on the issues of climate change and that you were looking at energy or carbon self-sufficiency in your country. And I think you mentioned that the forested countries of the world are subsidising the rich to the tune of, I think, $100 billion a year because of carbon sequestration. Can I suggest you a, uh, an approach and a strategy for redressing that long term? And I'll just talk about Professor Ross Garno's report, which in Australia addresses climate change in Australia. He talks about contract and converge as the long-term strategy for constraining carbon emissions. You're probably aware that under the Rio Convention and the Kyoto Protocol, Western countries have agreed to cap their carbon emissions based on their historic emissions because they've been very high per capita. But the suggestion is, in the more equitable way, particularly for poorer countries, is that each person should have an allocation of carbon emission. And that would mean that the poor countries, like the Pacific nations, would have emissions of carbon which they could trade with the West. And this is what Professor Garno is looking at long term. And it's certainly something that the uh, less developed countries of the world should be pushing for in terms of the long term strategies of Kyoto. And I, I just commend that sort of strategy to you. And you might have some thoughts on on that equitable carbon allocation per capita in the world. Thank you. I think uh, we've, uh, we've had some discussions uh, with Professor Gano. I think we know very well he was uh, uh, with, uh, with us for a long time. He knows us and he's, uh, he's working, I think his team is working very closely. Uh, before I came uh, here, I had uh, uh, some, uh, about three people, uh, from here who were following the uh, uh, program were with me and we were uh, we were on the island uh, taking uh, shots of what uh, we need to do uh, when uh, in 2010 when people uh, get together in Copenhagen and we are looking at that process uh, uh, very closely as I said we've just newly established and uh, uh, this is completely a new area uh, which uh, we, we try to develop and uh, uh, work at it. And I think we, we will be getting a lot of assistance and advice from Ross Gano. I've not seen his report, but I think uh, we've got contacts with him and uh, we, we know him personally. And uh, uh, that's something that I think he's been working with our team. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, Sir Michael, Bill Bertels from ABC uh, Radio News. Uh, just a regional question. Uh, I understand that... I'm right here at the back, sorry, I'm a long way away. I understand that uh, Fiji's government is looking increasingly unlikely to hold elections in March next year. I'm wondering, what is your approach to Fiji and what should be the approach of other regional leaders uh, to restoring Fiji to democracy? Last Nui meeting of the forum leaders, uh, that includes the Australian Prime Minister and the, uh, the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister, all of us, the Pacific leaders, were together in a little island atoll of Nuel, uh, Nui. And uh, the resolution was reached that uh, I think Fiji need to be told uh, that uh, they should be treated like uh, any other country. If there are military coups, we treat, should treat them as uh, li likewise. But I think uh, there is this feeling of Pacific consensus, consensus uh, that prevailed on the day and we've given Fiji another opportunity uh, for our ministerial committee to meet. Now they have uh, nominated uh, their representative on the ministerial uh, nomination com uh, committee and uh, they will be visiting Fiji uh, to sound uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Interim Prime Minister Bairamarama out on what our views are, uh, because I have been trying uh, 
as a, a good friend of Fiji uh, to try to intervene and uh, I had two uh, meetings with him on uh, fixing the date. The date was community gave him uh, 2009. He accepted that in the first place. But I think uh, we also have to understand his problem of having to put the act together on the any military regime when it takes over. All the disruption of government, work of government is completely uh, thrown out of the window. And he has, a, he has a responsibility to put it together again. A Fiji society is not happy, but what would they say? You've got a man with a gun, and you're trying to tell him that uh, go and sit on his table. I think he'll listen to you when, you, when he have his, his gun. And I think we're having this problem. But we're trying to use the Pacific way uh, to get him on side and uh, understand that uh, if Fiji is to play important role as it used to play in the Pacific, I think it's time that uh, he goes back to democratic elections and get a new government elected. I think message was clear from the forum leaders. Uh, now that he's agreed to, give in, uh, um, to be uh, in the group again, uh, we believe that uh, we would be able to achieve uh, something or some, some solution on uh, this question of bringing election forward. We've made two suggestions. Uh, suggestions where you either conduct the elections in uh, uh, June, June, August, or conduct it in uh, uh, November after presentation of your uh, charter. Providing charter, you cannot, uh, you can accept a charter. People can accept that, but to make it, uh, to make it constitution, uh, constitution, it's very difficult. You must have a, a parliament. It's only parliaments that uh, frames the constitution. So I think he's got a big uh, a question in front of him, and I'm hoping that the ministerial committee, when they meet, they will be able to uh, come up with some answers. <coughs> Uh, of course, some understanding from him. I've decided to have a meeting in Port Mosby uh, in December uh, to see if I can get all the leaders, and I've, I'm, I've specifically invited him. I want him to come to Port Mosby uh, for us and the Pacific leaders to sit together. Uh, this is a forum that we, we're not supposed to have, not a forum, but uh, I believe that I think by uh, sitting together and explaining to him that Australia's made it possible. Australian government has kindly agreed, at my request, uh, that uh, you allow Fiji to operate as it is. Uh, you have a, your diplomat back in Canberra and the Consul General in Sydney, and Australia has done that, and trying to ease, trying to make him comfortable uh, so that he comes to the conference table. So uh, we're doing everything possible uh, to get the, uh, Fiji on the conference table to agree on the election date. Thank you. Your own uh, forestry minister talked about corruption in the forestry department. There's 15 cases before the courts against logging companies. How do you change that culture in your country where your people value the forests um, as they are? And can you ever rid illegal logging from your country? World Bank does not own any forest. And we have to be frank with you. We own the forest, and our Papua New Guinea government has a constitution. We followed our constitution. We have rules and acts of parliament and rules that we follow in harvesting our forest. We have not just devastated our forest like people have done in the past to change their lifestyle. We know what we are doing, and uh, I sometimes get aggravated when people tell me uh, you are not doing the right thing. You don't know how my people live. You have not lived in the village like me. You don't find difficulty with the transport to get to the uh, market. You don't find yourself with no lights, no electricity. You will always live a comfortable life in New York. We have to harvest some of our forest so that we can earn revenue to change our lifestyle, to bring schools, to bring about the infrastructure, 
to bring health services to our people. And we have rules and regulations, and we have good forestry policy and forestry laws that we follow. We don't uh, just harvest. Sometimes uh, uh, your friends, your, our friends in media, uh, tend to sensationalize, sensationalize uh, the issue and make it uh, blow, blow it up to proportion, uh, out of proportion that uh, things are being devastated in Papua New Guinea. And sometimes we'd like you to take an opportunity. Come, go with me to the village. Go, me, go with me to the logging area and see for yourself. We've opted for selected logging now and that this policy will eventually come into place. For a certain hectare of land, you fell a certain trees. In tropics like Papua New Guinea, the forest does grow. 10 years time, 20 years time, you see this forest, new forest grows. So we have good reason to do it. Uh, we're not just felling forests and not taking care of our environment. We are concerned, like others are concerned about our environment. Others were not concerned when they were felling the trees in the old days. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.